Welcome to the online participants. Welcome, dear attendees here at Technische Universität Berlin. We start our three-day conference, Provenance Loves Wiki 2024. We have a roundtable discussion this evening and we will go further with a two-day workshop tomorrow and um, on Sunday. Um, we have an international audience watching us tonight from different parts of the world. And tonight, with the roundtable discussion, we are going to talk about the subject part of a global cultural commons, provenance research in 2024. And we are happy that we had this uh, every uh, participants attending. And all this could not have been possible without the uh, working group KUWIKI, Kunstwissenschaften und Wikipedia, Art History and Wikipedia, an initiative where art historians and volunteers from the different Wikimedia projects work together. And in behalf of KUWIKI, I want to welcome you all and I wish all participants exciting three days and we are very glad that we have Benedikt Sauer and Michael Hopp and Larissa Borg and Lynn Rother and Tobias Matzner that they had time to join this roundtable discussion and Lamba Teller, he's the head of the Open Science Lab in Hannover at the Technische Uni um, Informationsbibliothek and he's going to be moderator tonight. So we are very glad that we have him here. And maybe one could say the Wikiverse is a little bit like the Central Park in New York. It is open to the public. It's open 24 hours. Everyone can go. And there is a part of the people, some of them voluntarily try to make it a better place, maybe try to change it. And I don't talk only about Park Avenue ladies that have some time in between their charity projects. I talk about everyone. I talk about the public. And comparing Central Park with the Wikiverse, we could say some people go, some people never go, some people go and they enjoy it, and some people go, they enjoy it, and they say, I should have gone earlier in my life. <laughs> so whatever we are going to do together, what we are going to create together in the Wikiverse, once we combine our research questions with the Wikiverse projects. Let's see, we will see what we can do in the next three following days. And I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Waltraud, for the opening remarks. And uh, again, once more, welcome. We are super impressed uh, also the crowd here, so I, I became part of a telegram group of many people sitting here in the room and uh, who uh, relentlessly updated each other. Oh, I'm on the Flixbus, I will make it in time to Berlin and so on. And then on the other hand, we have this huge audience online. Uh, maybe you are sitting in your kitchen peeling potatoes and by the way, looking here, welcome, wonderful to have you too. And uh, when we, um, so in May last year or so, uh, Waltraud's wonderful KuWiki AG started to plan for this uh, event, imagine that. And uh, uh, when they invited me to be the moderator and guide you through tonight's panel, we were discussing a little bit, okay, what is the audience we have to expect? Is it more like provenance researchers, very serious people from art history? Or is it more like um, wiki nerds who relentlessly uh, um, change uh, things in Wikidata or so? And uh, the question is all of the above. So we have a super interesting mixture here and I'm really looking forward to the, to the discussion with you. 
and therefore we will um, for like 15 minutes from now or so um, I will ask our panelists about their opinion, their input, we will have a little bit of discussion here. But then for the last roughly 30 minutes of tonight's panel, we will ask you about your questions and you can already join in. There's a Slido QR code, maybe it's happening right now in my background. No, maybe not, but uh, it, it will be there at some point. Uh, you will find the link to the Slido and please add your questions there, really. And uh, don't tell anyone, but you can upvote uh, other people's questions as well in the Slido. And um, also, you can use, uh, if you are a librarian like me, the Fediverse, or if you are an art historian, maybe Instagram or so, I'm not sure, and use our hashtag PLW2024 and uh, make the discussion uh, public. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, one more thing to the audience here in the room. If you haven't done it yet, uh, please mute your phones. <laughs> Makes life easier for me as a moderator. And um, yeah, with this, uh, let me very, very quickly, quickly introduce you to our panelists today. So first of all, we will hear some input from Benedict Savoy. And uh, she needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. So <laughs> she, uh, Benedict is also, in a way, our host here tonight because she is a professor for uh, modern art history here at TU Berlin. And as you already know, uh, together with Felvin Saar, she kind of created the, the master plan for the, um, uh, for, for, uh, the France, the, the French, uh, France state strategy uh, regarding um, looted art from Africa. And uh, this is very impressive. And uh, the whole debate about uh, looted art uh, restitution uh, from African art pieces in European museums is heavily influenced by her, her work by now and we are re really glad to have her here. And um, we have also uh, Larissa Borg who is uh, in an interesting um, a double role, I might say, here, because uh, for one thing, she's a highly active Wikimedian and, in fact, um, uh, a member of uh, Wikimedia Germany's board, the Presidium in German. But she's also uh, a curator of the Zormlands Museum in Sweden. Uh, so she has this interesting double role and uh, of course uh, I might say she's also responsible for digital development at this museum. And um, uh, then we have here uh, Lynn Rota uh, who brings in another super interesting international perspective because Lynn is not only a provenance researcher but she worked uh, at the famous or you might say infamous, I don't know, Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz here in Berlin, but also for years at the MoMA in New York at the Museum for Modern Art. So this is a super interesting perspective before she took up her current professorship at the Leuphana University in Lüneburg. And uh, we are also glad to have Oh, that was my water can. So, uh, to have um, Maike Hopp here on my left side. And uh, Maike is uh, super well recognized for her work on looted art from the National Socialism area of Germany, uh, era of Germany, and also in general for her contribution to uh, provenance research. And she is also our host to tonight because she's also a professor uh, here at the TU Berlin. And last not least, to my very far left, Tobias Matzner, who is, uh, I would say, a computer scientist turned philosopher. And uh, uh, she, uh, he thinks in broader terms about um, what, what we need in terms of data and information. To, to make it happen, uh, the, the restitution of looted art, uh, a better grounded understanding and research 
on provenance. So uh, yeah, this is our panel tonight. And uh, I leave the stage now to Benedict. And Benedict, maybe you can tell us a little bit how uh, the uh, fact that we live in a digital world now uh, maybe uh, changed the way we do provenance research or what is happening in this field. Please. Thank you so much. I will be happy to speak in English, but it's not my very comfortable language because I, am, I have la, like something like goulash in my head between French, Italian and German. And since I'm used to speak in German when in, in these rooms, I would be happy if you can accept that I speak for three minutes in English, in, Do in German, in Deutsch. Vielen Dank für diese Frage. Es hat sich alles verändert, tatsächlich, äh, seitdem wir im digitalen Zeitalter sind, für das, was ich mache. Als ich an Und diese Frage, vielen Dank, ist eine Frage, die Sie an eine alte Frau stellen, die sozusagen als Fossil erzählen kann. Und es sind einige Kollegen und Kolleginnen hier, die diese Zeit miterlebt haben, diese Transformation. Die haben angefangen, über Museumsinventare oder so zu arbeiten in einer Zeit, wo es sowas nicht gab, wo die ersten Online-Collections ähm, im Entstehen waren. Ich erinnere mich Ende der 90er Jahre im Louvre, wie La Base Joconde entstand und das war alles so marvelous. Wir waren begeistert und der große Unterschied zwischen vor zehn Jahren, vor 20 Jahren und jetzt ist, dass die allgemeine Digitalisierung dazu führt, dass es eine allgemeinere Sichtbarkeit unter anderem von Sammlungsbeständen gibt. Das heißt, dass eine der großen selbstverständlichen Säulen von Institutionen wie Museen, mit denen ich oder über sie ich äh, gewohnt bin zu arbeiten, die eine dieser Selbstverständlichkeiten ist, äh, dass sie das Wissen haben und auch die Deutungshoheit, weil sie die Information haben und zwar materiell. Archive, Inventare etc. Und im digitalen Zeitalter äh, ist diese Information immer weniger geheim zu halten. Es geht immer noch, aber dass die Einfachheit, eine PDF mit einem gesamten Inventar freiwillig oder nicht freiwillig im großen Publikum zu haben, ist einfach gegeben. Und äh, das führt dadurch, dass die, ähm, dieses, das, was ich gerne lange als Familien Geheimnis bezeichnet habe, nämlich das Wissen der Museen über sich selbst ganz langsam gar kein Geheimnis ist, sondern eine große Masse an Informationen, mit der wir alle gemeinsam machen können, was wir wollen. Und manche wollen es wissen, wie viel Blut an Objekten klebt, die in unseren Museen sind. Manche wollen andere Fragen stellen an das Material, aber das Material ist da. Und da die Museen, jedenfalls staatliche Museen in Europa, uns allen gehören, dem Publikum, äh, ist das eine gute Nachricht, dass wir auch über deren äh, Geschichte und Geschichten selber forschen können und nicht warten müssen, bis sie für uns vorgekaut werden, diese Geschichten. Das war's und normalerweise habe ich drei Minuten geschafft. <lacht> Many thanks, Benedict. Super interesting uh, input. And um, yeah, maybe we can uh, translate a little bit some, some of your thoughts to, to English. So uh, Benedict stated that uh, uh, the change with the digital age is huge indeed for, for this field. So um, uh, in fact, uh, it's like that uh, everything can be made transparent now and uh, that there is no, uh, not necessarily any exclusive, excluding control of museums and other institutions uh, about what happens with the collections and with the objects within the museums. And uh, this means also that uh, expectations change and that the Deutungshoheit, I, I don't know the English word right it's now. So it's, it's a very uh, uh, probably interesting. Okay, okay. Well, Auf Französisch what? würden wir sagen, nachdem ich 30 Jahre lang nach einer Übersetzung gesucht habe, yeah. uh, Informationsmonopol, also ah. Monopol de l'Information, und das geht auch auf Englisch. Ah. Hm? Information monopoly, interesting. So. Yeah, okay. Let's 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 call it that. Yeah. <laughs> that this um, changes, but we also. Um, uh, uh, have this experience 
that we must not wait any longer for the museums to make things happen, to, to understand what is problematic about the objects. But maybe we still wait, so there's a tension also happening there. It's maybe some translation, uh, maybe somebody can add, but yeah, thanks. And um, yeah, and, and I, I will directly turn this uh, into a question to, to Larissa. And I wonder if there's um, a reason uh, for, the, yeah, for the slow speed of the museum. So it seems that we uh, still wait for things to happen or that there's a lack of information. Uh, otherwise, I, I, I cannot explain why uh, we have this um, tension of debates about provenance research and so on. So there must be some lack of information. And is there something like um, Eigenlogik of museums that they are slow with, with, with digitization? Or what, 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 what is the problem? Can, can you tell us a little bit about this from the museum perspective? I think it's easy to always blame the museums uh, that it's their fault that we are that they are slow because I think indeed that the museums have been underfunded especially in, uh, in Europe um, and that we have some systematic issues with museums how they work with their collections but um, they also are living in kind of a system and a legal context where it's kind of difficult and they can have a kind of an easy way to make it difficult. We are living in an age where museums can use copyright if they want to, as an exception uh, for not making things accessible. Um, and um, we can always blame the economics uh, that things aren't accessible. Um, and I think that we should, um, as a public, we should be much more demanding. Um, but as uh, museum employees, we should also be uh, much more um, collaborative in our um, uh, approach to the public. Um, and I think we just stop. Um, we should stop um, finding excuses, um, uh, as well as in infrastructure and in economics. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, so, so you would make the point that it's up to uh, the public and uh, adjusting the expectations about museums, but at the same time it's also about um, a, a change of habits that you expect from, work, from the people working in museums, right? No, I think we have to find common uh, grounds in our priorities. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we can't do everything at the same time. Um, but we, if we, for example, have a program where we are uh, focusing on making things accessible and making it also um, as um, um, mandatory for, for example, state-funded museums to actually work on um, making things accessible, that would be a huge difference, um, especially, especially um, when we are looking also at, at uh, the national differences. We have totally different approaches to making um, um, to making exceptions for um, accessibility um, online when we look at different, only in Europe and the different uh, nations. I mean, when we look at France, for example, um, I mean, we have a kind of an, uh, there's, I think it's the only country I know that have a, has an active open glam um, community, which is like open glam, the uh, open glams, libraries, ar archives and museums. And um, I mean, Germany is, as you said, uh, the country of Deutung, Deutungshoheit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, we need to join forces as well on the European level when it comes mm. to those questions. Yeah, let's let's come back to this idea of making things mandatory later. <laughs> I think this is one one main uh, important point to discuss here. Uh, s s thanks a lot for the input, Larissa. And um, now I would like to turn. Uh, to Michael, I mean, uh, you um, uh, you have this huge background with uh, provenance research in different direction. I, I, I would say, and I'm I'm wondering if there's uh, so so what 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 is the status quo of this kind of information? Do we have a, a balanced, uh, equitable uh, information about um, uh, looted art and and uh, other problematic uh, collections, or is there uh, so to say uh, a bias? and what we know um, now from, from the uh, side of the museums. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Well, that's a difficult question. So um, I, I would have to step back a little bit. Um, I think that currently have a, we have a very imbalanced perception of what provenance research 
is and um, especially a imbalance perception of um, of provenance research on Nazi looted art. So there are currently some um, figures um, that are always recurring, like um, that there have been, um, for example, 600,000 objects that have been looted um, by the Nazis. Um, in contrast, we have only um, or just over 20 restitution cases that have been discussed in front of the Beratende Kommission, which is an advisory panel here in, in, in Germany. Um, but these figures are completely unreliable. So um, since signing the so-called Washington Principles, on Holocaust era sets in 1998, at least 7,500 cultural obje objects from Germany uh, or from German institutions, such as museums and also libraries and, and archives, have effectively been restituted. And it's um, um, more likely that there are far more because there's no mandatory um, system for, for um, uh, yeah, um, reporting restitutions. But um, there's, of course, a, a huge gap that we have. So um, there's no um, comprehensive inventory of, of the millions of objects that I would um, think um, that have been seized by the Nazis. So there's an inability to estimate a concrete number of objects that we are looking for. And um, this is also due to the circumstances and, and the me different mechanisms of um, the successive expropriation of predominantly Jewish or racially defined as Jewish citizens or other persecuted groups by the Nazi regime. So um, what we need um, is to adjust our perception a little bit. So we, we, when we're picturing um, Nazi loot, um, we might imagine or one might imagine that Gestapo, Gestapo officers went to a flat by um, 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 uh, yeah, arriving in trucks, breaking into the homes, um, grabbing the um, artworks and, and transporting them to wherever, and also um, meticulously um, keep recording these <laughs> <laughs> um, actions. Well, yes, indeed, such focused incidents occurred but they were only a very, very small fraction of what we today call the Nazi loot. So um, before this, um, the systematic deprivation of the financial livelihood through uh, discriminatory discriminatory taxes, sorry, um, um, led the persecuted to, um, to force sales of, um, of luxury items such as um, uh, antiques, jewelry, and of course also artworks. And other objects have been confiscated by customs authorities. So, um, not to mention the numerous chaotic and violent confiscations in occupied Western and especially Eastern territories, um, which remained undocumented at all. So, there is this gap that we um, might to, um, or might maybe um, Phil, but um, if we are faced with these masses um, to really deal with, we also need masses of data to be transparent, to be available online. Um, th thanks a lot. Super, super interesting. So uh, you, you, you would say. Uh, no, no matter what, 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 what the specific history of um, the objects are, it's always an, uh, so uh, an important general rule to have uh, um, to make as much data available um, for research as possible to, in order to, 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 uh, to, to, to act in a meaningful way about it. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, yeah we, we need the information on, on the stolen or looted objects on one hand, and we, of course, need the information on the objects that are here in our institutions and our museums as well. So if we only um, yeah, um, bundle this information, this data, on um, German platforms that are um, yeah, um, inaccessible to, to people from abroad. This will make no sense for anyone um, who is descendant of someone who uh, got 
um, persecuted or murdered and is now living in the third generation anywhere around the world, doesn't speak German and wants to um, yeah, do research himself or herself. Um, so we have the same problem with Deutungshoheit. We are processing data only for our researchers and these are researchers in a state that is still the perpetrator state. But the information needs to go out to the world, to everyone who um, has the right to get this information and to do research on its own. Thank, thanks yeah. a lot again. I, uh, we will definitely come back to this. Mm. It's also a uh, super interesting and important question, it seems. And uh, Lynn, I, I would like to turn to you. I um, introduced you as someone who brings in this <laughs> perspective across the Atlantic and, and uh, having experienced this. Uh, I mean, these are entangled histories, I imagine. And it's not like uh, that... Um, the situation in the US must not be totally different than ours here in Germany, but still, is there, um, is there something you learned and what you can tell us <laughs> about the, 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 the differences in the approach of the Americans uh, to, towards all of this? Where to start? And also yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and also, I mean, at the, at the risk of also overstepping or misjudging, I think there's also other audience, I hope online, um, who actually also work in US museums today, but I, where they would sort of want to maybe point out for now is there is in a way a different approach on how provenance research has happened on both sides of the Atlantic. And interestingly, in a way, the US museums, if you think of museums as like sort of these institutions that are now most hold accountable for the histories of objects, more so than the art market, which I think is a shame and is another topic for another conversation. Mm. But museums as these like stewards of collections who have the man actually the mandate to research the objections, to share their collections and to publish them in an as transparent way as possible, also echoing what I said earlier. With regards to provenance, the American museums were actually very early on, right in the 2000s, on publishing their provenances for objects that had either gaps and that were or might have been in Europe during the Nazi era. That happened even when still today is sort of often mentioned as the like paradise in one database. That database is called as NIPIP. It's still online and it's outdated the moment it was online. <laughs> because I think databases that rely on museums to share information and keep them updated, <laughs> while museums also keep their own records up to date, is, I think, unrealistic in a field where we actually have to do with all the things that have been neglected for the last decades, which mm -hmm. is cataloging, number one, in museums. I liked your idea of um, maybe, you know, we need to change the incentive structure mm. on, like, mm -hmm. on cataloging. Mm -hmm. So cataloging was neglected. The second thing that was neglected was uh, in-depth object research, which for which provenance is one part, and the third is digital infrastructure. So this group, which seems like so natural to us, is still, I would say, a rather niche group of actually thinking how can we transform provenances so they're actually really accessible. And I think it is not anymore if museums share information, now we need to think on how museums share information. It is not, it is not enough, as we see, how cumbersome it is to collect data, and then can go on about that in many facets, but how cumbersome it is to collect free texts, to structure them and make them analyzable. So I think that it needs to be a rethinking on how to record data and then how to share it so that actually researchers can really access information as in an as transparent and as easy way as possible. Yeah. So that <coughs> we have, for example, an inventory of looted objects we might not have, but we ha might have an inventory of all the objects that have left colonial territories um, and are today, for example, in US museums and German museums and French museums. And then we can cross-reference. And then we start, only start, really to build against this information asymmetry that we have yeah. at the moment. So I think there's Deutungshoheit, mm -hmm. and there's also this information asymmetry that really mm -hmm. comes into play, like who who has mm -hmm. access to that information? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So there's so much uh, <laughs> yeah. that what you told us, what you learned, and what what you now told us. So so I I think this. Uh, uh, concept of having separated uh, buckets, so to say, of information is inherently not, not good enough for, for the kind of research that we need. Do I understand this right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so um, siloed information. Siloed information. Okay, that's a key word here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, I think this is a great keyword for you to be mm. So uh, is this really like? I mean, uh, we we have now uh, uh, recently um, uh, we have learned so many new approaches on how to overcome maybe uh, these hurdles and and ways to connect information and do things with digital information and. Um, <clears throat> As this is a lot about uh, not uh, uh, being an isolated museum that is responsible anymore for, for data, but um, also ma maybe museums together or maybe complete new actors collaborating on all of this. How do you see uh, is this shaped by new technological approaches? Or to put it uh, from, from, uh, in another way, um, is there... Uh, a technical approach that we need to make it happen, to connect the data, the information in a meaningful way? Okay, that's again a very huge question. Thanks. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry to be asked. Yeah. Thanks, first of all, uh, of being here. I quickly wanted to correct your introduction because I'm not a provenance researcher. I yeah, think sorry. about the possibilities yeah. and also politics of digital methods more generally. But I think um, your question really connects well to what Lynn said a minute before on the difference between if information is available at all and how it is available. Mm -hmm. I think this is, this is key here. Um, because even if Benedict said in the beginning, digital methods kind of make information less easy to contain and a PDF might slip out to the public. <laughs> um, this is only a, a starting point, but for many research questions that researchers have, we need more structured data. So w one technological invention, and I think the, the reason Wiki is, is, stands here on, on the slide, behind, was written in the slide behind us, it has a reason there, is, is to talk about this. And this, of course, maybe not for this audience, but generally this sounds a bit boring, right? We need to talk about standards, and <laughs> so we need a, a commitment to linked open data and to frameworks that make all of the, the hurdles that have just mm. been mentioned not go away, but easily, more easily overcome. Um, but this also brings up, I guess, new questions. For example, in the very beginning, um, Larissa mentioned also kind of possibly things that should be mandatory for museums. So when we now think about, do we have new methods? Do we have even more actors, even a, a community maybe, right? This also opens the question how to balance responsibility. So what should a museum be doing or should have to do to make then other actors maybe more easily um, available or more, more easily um, introduced in, the, in, in this field? Because digital technology, and this is a very general point, very often things uh, make gifts of the present digital solution, right? So we don't need to change because now we have technology. And, <laughs> and th th that's a question that is here too. And then another point, which I guess in, in regard to your question, it's very important is that when we make information more open, we need to think about how this is, but this needs to, to, to engage with the fact that we have different audiences here. So you <laughs> mentioned a bit like the general audience, people should know, like we're the public, these are our museums, we should know what's in there. Then others mentioned research, right? We are, we are researchers, we are all more or less academics. Um, we have different questions that needs different data. And then you mentioned questions of, 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 of um, knowledge uh, equity or like even the, the, the politics of like who has, who, who has a political or even moral right to, to that information and who gets that. And this is yet another audience, right? Um, that, that maybe is very specific because it, it only targets a comparatively small group. For example, descendants of people who, who got expropriated in, in, in one or other dark parts of our history, um, but a very important group in that regard. And, and so m 
making information available in a form that speaks to those audiences is maybe something that digital technology can facilitate, but also needs to be thought of as a requirement to facilitate that. Um, super interesting. Okay, so uh, you would say there are uh, several um, conditions uh, the information should meet in order to um, um, th that we can work on it in a way that it caters different audiences, diff different goals and purposes. Um, but, but these are this is a lot about um, um, standards in terms of uh, how we prepare, how we set up data. Is this right? Standards, but also. Yeah means of communication, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. both in a very like technical sense of how do, does my database communicate with other people's databases, because we won't have the general database of provenance research. I don't mm -hmm. think even that that's not a good idea, but also in a very personal, even political sense, how do we address people who, as I said, have, have a real strong incentive to know something and, and get that information in a way that they can deal with. Right. So it's not just a sta standard, it's maybe more for the technical part, and that's one side, but there's also a, a communicative part, I guess. Then. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's a strategy part yeah. also. <laughs> it is like museums today should have a data strategy, yeah. which actually takes account of this audience, talks to people, like what are, di what are the different needs? What are the needs from claimants? What are the needs from researchers? What are the needs from etc.? And Often, a digital is, it's not only technology will solve it, it's also that's a digital department, they deal with the digital. Well, in fact, now in the digital world or era or however you want to call it, it is a concept that actually should inform many decisions in all departments. Mm -hmm. And one is, for example, if we think an object that you can't do this without the actual humanities research, you can't do this with the art historians, the ethnologists, the etc. how to record it. So a strategy, and also it is not only that's uh, like that's the digital, the other hold of often that recognize is it's like if there is a really digital savvy person in a good position in a museum they strive and move it forward but if someone then leaves this museum might also really go back to mm. their uh, like sort of 1940s 1950s approach on writing inventory <laughs> parts so and this is i think not actually adequate for 21st century because museums are public institutions and should deal with their data in the same way they deal with the many other knowledge resources uh, they provide and claim to provide. Well, Definitely. You, do you want to respond directly? Yeah, I want yeah. to mm. just say that everything I want to back that. But I think there are two things that I would um, underline is that first, I don't think that museums uh, should have um, data strategies because in an ideal world, every museum would actually have the uh, capacities internally to work on such a thing. but. As we all know, museums, they don't. Um, uh, so I think what we actually need uh, is a European view, uh, a professional view on data. We need to professionalize how uh, um, we look at data in the museum space. And I mean, there are a lot of standards when it, for example, comes to um, collection management in the physical space. But the standards and the compulsory rules for digital, digital collections management are totally underdeveloped. And for mm. example, we have too few... Um, 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 Say it in German, no problem. I just have the Swedish <laughs> word. <Sorry. laughs> no. no, this doesn't help. <laughs> Bedingungen. But yeah, conditions. 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 Uh, we have too few conditions for uh, collection management systems. Um, when a museum buys a, a collections management system or buys mm -hmm. a license for it, we are actually enclosed in it for the next two decades because no one wants to change a collections management system. Um, been there, done that, that's enough. Um, <laughs> I think that what we need to do is actually to work with those companies that they actually have to imply data standards in the systems because then mm. the museum never has to think about it again and never has to do the things and think about the standards because we will ne never have a person who knows everything about data at every museum. And there we actually connect to your point, uh, Maike, 
about that, um, as you also said in our conversation before, that it's not only about the artworks, it's also about mm. the books, the photo albums, and those lie in smaller museums. Those don't lie at MoMA, they, those lie at county museums or um, even uh, local museums. And those are the institutions that we need to um, also get into the system. And I don't think that we can actually rely on the single institution. We have to build it into the systems that they are using. And I mean, if we're walking, talking about the audiences, yeah. I mean, there we have the wiki community. It's not that difficult to all, always theorize about communities out there, the audience, what they might need. You can actually talk to them. Mm. Um, mm. You don't have to think about them in a theoretical way. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, Benedict? No, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah? I, I, I just wanted to add, there's another group of institutions that the, we shouldn't forget about, and it's the archives, because yeah. we also mm -hmm. need the archives, the um, information, the documents from the archives, because if um, someone is doing provenance research within a museum and might have uh, the entry in, in the inv inventory book that this... Um, um, object was um, um, or came as a present by uh, Mrs. or Mr. XY, um, this won't help at the first moment. So we would also need the information from the archives that, or the documents from the archives, the arch archival records that would give us a clue who is this person and was this person persecuted or not. So um, yeah, we shouldn't forget about that when we just blame the museums that we also need <laughs> archives. Benedict, nee. feel free to respond in yeah. German, if you like. Yeah, danke. Yeah. Uh, nee, ich wollte ein, ein paar Begriffe mm. einfach zusammenbringen aus meiner Perspektive einer Historikerin oder auch die mit, sich mit Geschichte von Provenienz äh, befasst. Das ist der Begriff der, des äh, Obligatorischen, äh, der Strategie oder Nichtstrategie. Äh, also diese beiden Begriffe zusammen und die Deutungshoheit. Also was klar ist, ist, dass die Museen im deutschsprachigen Raum in den 70ern eine Antistrategie hatten. Während die anderen in der Schweiz, in Frankreich äh, angefangen haben, mit großen Computern zu arbeiten, gab es hier Verantwortliche, also 60-jährige Museumsdirektoren der 70er Jahre, die auf Tagungen <lacht> öffentlich, wenn Jüngere kamen und erzählt haben, wir wollen jetzt Computer benutzen, die dann, und das ist gut dokumentiert, in Tagungsbänden gesagt haben, nein, also, Invent also Informatik darf nicht ein eigener Zweck werden und das ist alles Quatsch und so. Und diese Leute wurden immer öffentlich gedemütigt mit dem, er mit dem Ziel, nicht diese Instrumente nicht zu nutzen. Und du sprachst, Lin, vorhin von allem, was äh, versäumt wurde, von diesem Neglected, alles, was nicht gemacht wurde, das war eine Strategie. Das ist nicht einfach nur Neglected worden, weil man andere Sachen, zum Beispiel den Mauerfall hatte oder so, sondern es war schwarz auf weiß eine Strategie, um keine Transparenz, jedenfalls was ethnologische sogenannte Sammlungen angeht, um sie nicht um keine Begehrlichkeiten, Zitat aus solchen Papieren, keine Begehrlichkeiten zu wecken, sollten wir unsere Listen nicht veröffentlichen. Dementsprechend wollen wir keine jungen Leute, also die 30-Jährigen von 1970, <lacht> die sich mit, äh, mit Computern befassen. Die sind, es gab keine Computer, selbst als die E-Mails eingeführt wurden vor in den 90ern, hatten die Berliner Museen, ich glaube bis 2019, keine E-Mails. Und so weiter. Und das war, das ist eine <lacht> Strategie. Und deswegen glaube ich, dass es schon wichtig ist, irgendetwas Strategisches zu sehen, mhm. auch im Nichtgemachten. Und zu dem Obligatorischen, ich sitze hier und bin sehr, sehr, habe große Ohren mhm. und ich profitiere sehr von dem Gespräch und denke trotzdem immer, warum ist es nicht einfach zu sagen, dass ein, ein Museum wie eine Bibliothek oder eine Bibliothek ohne Katalog wäre ein Bücherhaufen. <lacht> oder? Man hat Bücher und man hat keine Straße, keine Schlüssel, um reinzukommen. Und kein Bibliothekar würde sagen, warte ab, bis ich alles gelesen habe. Und dann sage ich dir, was drinsteht. Das ist absurd, sie lachen. Aber eigentlich ist ein Museum genauso. Ein Museum ohne zugänglichen Katalog ist ein Objekthaufen, ein Flohmarkt. Und wir können so. Und deswegen, ich höre alles über Standardisierung etc. Das ist wichtig. Aber was aus meiner Perspektive, ich arbeite lieber mit PDFs, die geleakt sind, als dass ich warte, bis irgendeine 
Standardisierung erfolgt ist, auf EU-Ebene, ja. weil mhm. dann bin ich schon mhm. mehrmals tot. Mhm. Und <lacht> Schade. Ja, I ja, yeah, so, so, so uh, I, I try to <laughs> translate a little bit. So, uh, um, Benedict just turned out that uh, it's not just that uh, these um, uh, uh, information depths, so to say, of the museums are a neglected task, but in a way for the case of uh, German museums, uh, ethnological um, collections, ethnographic collections and so on, Uh, even into the 1990s, it was kind of a strategy even to uh, neglect and to uh, not make use of uh, what would have been available already, so in the 90s obviously not Wikidata, but <laughs> other means, um, because there was even uh, the expression of uh, uh, let's not Uh, Wegbegehrlichkeiten, I don't know a good uh, translation for this, maybe somebody can help me. So, so let's n let not um, uh, provoke uh, people to ask for more information, like uh, for evoke restitution. Of yeah, for restitution. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. And with having in mind, of course, then restitution, maybe, right? And, and uh, so uh, that um, there is inherently already a strategy going on and we have to Take, have this uh, st st uh, strategy uh, view on this, because it's already in place there. And uh, she also made the point that uh, it's absolutely the necessary precondition to do anything meaningful with the example of libraries. So uh, a library is just a mass, a flea market of uh, any books, and it would not be um, good to wait for the librarians to read all of the books before you make your judgment about what is in there, but instead you expect, rightly so, that they uh, give you the inventory and the catalog and the proper standardized data of what they have. So, I think you were first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sort of, I think it's worth to repeat that actually. It's Because it's very, it's very true for provenance researchers. It's like, do you need as a librarian to read the entire book, understand <laughs> it, interpret before you put it in online catalog? And there are and some librarians have, who think and that. We have, and we have, <laughs> no, and I think we have really seen that. Um, and I think with with best intentions in Germany, that so much money has gone into research, while in fact, uh, really, the majority of objects it's still not even accessible. And that is a, uh, I mean, these are these. Yeah, questions that a museum needs to decide, so that's why I am for this data <laughs> strategy, but yes, in consortia. But when I've done provenance research at the Berlin Museum, at the Kupferstich Kabinett and at the Kunstgewerbe Museum, these are collections that have 500,000 objects, 650,000 objects, I think, is the Kupferstich Kabinett in Berlin. So there work 10 people. Um, and the curators don't have the time, even with the loans, with the exhibitions, etc., to update. And still, this is a priority question of like, also, what kind of stuff do you have? And working at a Museum of Modern Art, it is 260,000 <laughs> objects with 200 curators. <laughs> and you also have six or seven curatorial levels. So you have catalogers, you have curatorial assistants, you have associate curators, curators, uh, chief curators, cu curators at large. Um, and these tasks, of course, that come with the collection are also on many shoulders, but catalogers, for example, is a job that is, I mean, it's a fantastic um, job at some point in your career. You really learn the collection. And, and I think there is, and this is sort of echoing Benedict's argument, there's also a, like, I say it sometimes, quick and dirty, put the data out because there's actually also so much knowledge out there that can enhance it, make it better, can point. And that is also really my experience with having worked at a Museum of Modern Art, when you have outdated provenances online, because you are not able to keep them updated, people reach out and say, mm -hmm. like, actually, yeah. I know, um, mm -hmm. you know, this object. So, so you have all benefits. A, you are not permanent, you're not in this defense position. B, you have the chance of gaining knowledge, see claimants have a chance to find the object. So it's like, sometimes it's just putting it out there, even if it's outdated, mm. false, wrong, not fully vetted. I think that is key mm. and under Esther. 
Do you want to? Respond? Yeah, I think the two worst enemies of museums are perfection and projects. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I think um, both of them are, go together because in the museums where I worked, it was always like, now nah, we can't really publish it, it's not tidied. And the museums will never ever tidy every, all of their online catal catalogs. Um, and so one of the most important policies that I'm working with is publish as much as soon as possible. Um, because that's the only way we will get it done, because we get then mails, and I'm one of the persons who are sitting at the other side of that kind of mailbox uh, where you can send your questions about online collections, and we get so much information from the public uh, that we would never um, be able to actually um, find out ourselves. People who have mm. lived in buildings that we have in old photographs, um, who can identify the streets, people, and so on. Um, and then on the other hand, projects is um, one of the biggest issues in the museum field because we always get people in there working for three years and then they are gone. And mm. what they've built is in the worst uh, of all cases, a database which will not be updated and uh, not be managed at all. Um, or they uh, take all the knowledge that they've built up uh, with them to another institution. Mm. Yay for the institution, bad for the other institution that actually just lost knowledge. And the issue is that when we look at the policy level of um, projects, it always looks good for the people giving the money, like, oh, how nice it is that someone spent a little bit of money on a museum, a private sector institution, or even a public sector institution. But after those three years, you will hear as an institution, yeah, but you got money for it. You got a nice, nice sum of money for cataloging or doing some uh, research on that topic but it never helps in the long, uh, in the long mm. run. Mm. And it can make things even worse. So maybe, I, so maybe that again supports what I said earlier about thinking about data really as not just meant to be there <laughs> for the sake of itself, but meant for a certain audience. And for some audience mm. it just suffices, put it on the website, bad photograph or whatever, or, or the PDF. And, and, and you gain something, and for other questions, you want more structured data, also more sustainable uh, data. Because what you just said, I have to, I, I think, I don't want to be like uh, talking bad about people on the, on, the, on the podium here, but that also <laughs> happens in research, right? So many research projects build a database or a computer model or whatever, and then the Pearson does their PhD and goes somewhere else and it's the database sits in a computer and one day somebody switches off this computer and then it's 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 gone and and the research is gone right and that's a, that's a problem we also have it's not just a problem that museums have uh, so and, and and to address that more like long-term issues of sustainability and so I think it still makes sense to think about standards even if I completely <laughs> I uh, understand your fear that not all of us might be dead until we, 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 we have something, but it's, it's that I think that's not a reason not to, to, to push mm -hmm. for that. Uh, for, for other reasons than the reasons for which you are completely content with just publishing something quick and dirty on your website. Very interesting point. So I would like to... Uh, have a question to all of you uh, because I see a certain tension here between what you what you told us now. Uh, on the one hand side, um, you stress the responsibility very specifically of museums, and and uh, you agreed. It, it seems to me you agreed that uh, there's a um, what even be deliberately uh, to to neglect this. Uh, Tech, so, so this data or information debt towards the public. So this is uh, up to the museums in a way, because I, even if I would be interested as a lay person or so, I could not enter the magazine of the museum mm. where the good things are hidden or so. This is the one thing that you stressed. And then there was this other thing that, uh, however bad, the data or, or neglected, neglecting the standards that are already out there or formats or so, uh, it uh, must be good to involve the public and communities and uh, different audiences and so on. And now I learned uh, just, just before the discussion started a new word from Larissa <laughs> and that is uh, wiki washing. <laughs> no, no, but you, 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 
but 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 that, you, you you get my point, right? So so the question is, can, uh, would you like a kind of uh, outsource the the uh, responsibility that you have in that way, or how do you balance the involvement of, of communities of outsiders and your own, what you have to do on your own? It's Sorry. also it's also what not a, a question. Yeah. <laughs> it's also not <laughs> an yeah. easy question to, <laughs> to find an answer yeah. for. But um, as long as we only focus on museums, um, I think we we oversee or we neglect that there are also, in my case, for for the um, NAS, um, national socialist periods, that there are families, that there are descendants who might contribute knowledge to um, what was stolen um, or what is missing and um, that might also have archives, might have photographs. And as long we, as we only focus on museums and um, also see the whole responsibility in the hands of museums, we, we will um, not get in touch with the people who, who might have um, information that we would, um, or also the museums would need. So I think that this is an important point to get um, this whole process into a broader um, audience and broader public um, to, to really um, get together the last pieces of information that might be out there somewhere. So, so yeah. it's a shared responsibility anyway from the very beginning because uh, the uh, objects are in fact uh, distributed and, and, and uh, they need to be connected, there's, there's uh, this, this need to connect them, right? Well, uh, I wouldn't only say responsibility because responsibility I would say that this is more on the side of, 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 of the perpetrators, of, of the families. Mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Um, of people who, who have been involved in, in, in the loot. But um, there's also the chance for um, descendants of, of uh, murdered and, and um, persecuted to, um, to say, well, here I am and there is some information that I cannot deal with because I didn't knew my grandmother, but there is a... Um, there is an album of photographs um, still in my possession. I don't know, was it her Munich flat, was it her um, flat in Würzburg, but maybe this could help to identify paintings or to identify um, other um, objects. And um, to, to communicate with these people is something that we all also really completely missed in the last um, two decades, I think. And not completely, there have been some exceptional cases, but I don't think it's enough. And um, we should also show what we are doing here and not only do our research for our own. I don't need this research for me to be done. I need this research for, for them to be done, for all of the communities that um, still have the right to, to know where they're um, cultural goods have gone to. Yeah, but uh, that would not be outsourcing, right? This would be to finally m make accessible a very important and legitimate source of knowledge that so far has been neglected. I think what you intended with the term wiki washing <laughs> was really. Yeah, you, you said outsourcing, right? That was, was yeah, your term. Yeah, outsourcing and of the. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I, I, I think. That, 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 that there's a danger here because I guess many of these questions are really difficult questions that need expert knowledge, right? That need the knowledge of historians and art historians and maybe ethnographers and other experts that, that can, can deal with that information on the one hand. So I think that can probably not be outsourced, uh, but getting more input for those people and more resources for, for those experts that might, might be a valuable way to go. And then, one, as you already mentioned, outsourcing, which is a sort of industry uh, term, uh, you have to add money into the calculation, <laughs> right? Because you can't blame uh, museums for outsourcing something which they couldn't afford to pay anyway. So. <laughs> okay, 
I need to totally uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, it wasn't even a thing. I think we just came up and okay. um, up with it in our conversation. Um, what I meant was that um, I think working with communities is kind of a trend right now in museums and even in mm. archives and libraries. And it's a much more serious thing than a little project that you can do on the side. And one of the things that I see right now, not necessarily in Germany, but in other um, uh, countries around the world, where Wikipedia, uh, especially, but even Wikimedia Commons, has become kind of um, a thing in the glam world, um, that museums kind of use it to wiki wash their image. They, they engage with the community uh, and they um, uh, upload a bunch of images um, with limited metadata and low quality um, and then they feel good about themselves and then they can go, they go, can go to a museum conference and talk about it. And I think uh, that's not uh, helpful at all. Uh, that's not how you work with a community like the wiki community. You have to take it um, serious in the long term. Um, it's not enough to just batch upload uh, 1,000 images and take a, like make a press release about it. Um, that's what I uh, that's what mm. I meant with so sorry it's for not, it's, it's not necessarily yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. outsourcing. Yeah. It's just yeah. you can't you can't yeah. just like put an, a task on a community and then refrain from it. You have mm. to um, yeah. go in uh, for the long run. So, so if I get this right, this is about thinking what kind of different communities you have. With uh, beyond the boundaries of your institution, who you need to work with, and um, you have to take responsibility yeah. for the actions mm -hmm. that you're taking. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to engage with a, whatever kind of community outside of uh, the museum sector, you have to know about the effects that your steps and your um, your work can have. It can be a really like I really liked, for example, how the Errols and Archives worked with mm -hmm. their um, yeah. community mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. to transcribe. Um, Files, they were really into both um, reflecting about the effects that that kind of work can have on the participants, that it's actually uh, hard work and that it can have emotional um, mm -hmm. um, Effect. effects on the participants. Um, but they um, also were really transparent of what was the output that both the institution and the participants gained from that collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not just dumping things on the internet to get the things done. Yeah. So, so you need a data strategy. <laughs> <laughs> you need a data strategy. <laughs> definitely, definitely. That's, that's part of it. And uh, in case you, you didn't hear about this before, this is a Every Name Counts yeah. campaign, hugely successful mm. because they reached out to a huge audience and really got a meaningful, a rich feedback, right, yeah. from the data. Mm. And um, I, yeah, I would like to see yeah. that with provenances. Ah, yeah, it's okay. like, yeah. at least to try it. And I, But it is, I agree, it is... I mean, it is time consuming train. And when we work with students in structuring the provenance texts, it's also, I mean, we use AI, Fabio will talk about it tomorrow, we use AI to structure it. So we annotate a third of the data or 10% of the data, then AI does its magic and it's kind of structured. And then sort of the expert comes in and fine edits. But there where the computer really fails, it's actually also really complex for human beings. Yeah. Because transforming the data and then yeah you know, if we think for example you know such a well-known example as the benin bronxes and then you have sir ralph moore as one of the military people who was a key figure but then if you actually transfer the data which is now object centered into event centered like for example cdoc crm or if you would build it in in wiki so who stole the object in your um in your structure and what is that entity? Is it then Ralph Moore personally or is it the British military? And is the British military still today the British military? Is that something that has existed over centuries? So what is fascinating for future research, this agency who acted is extremely problematic when the computer only understands zero and one. And mm. this is then where we get into the nitty gritty where citizen science. I'm curious to see where it goes, but it definitely. Benedict. Ich wollte gerne und ich bin dankbar jetzt für das nigerianische Beispiel, weil das, was wir besprochen haben über die Arbeit mit Communities, erstens stimme ich sehr zu, dass das Ganze eine transformative Wirkung hat, wenn man das ernst nimmt. Wir hatten hier an der TU 
drei Jahre lang ein Projekt mit äh, der Universität von Chang in Kamerun. Und ich kann sagen, dass wir kollektiv und ich individuell komplett transformiert wurde durch diese ernsthaft gemeinsame Hände im Motor haben. Ähm, und, und, und das, was wir über Standards sagen oder arbeiten mit Communities, gerade die ganze Zeit, war in einem sehr homogenen Raum. Sagen wir mal, wir Europäer unter uns unterhalten uns über Standards etc. Ähm, wenn wir außerhalb von diesem Rahmen sind, dann ist nicht nur die Frage, wer hat die Objekte mitgenommen äh, aus Nigeria, aus dem aktuellen Nigeria, sondern es geht viel tiefer in die Strukturen und das hat fast nichts nur mit Digitalem zu tun, also mit Tabellen, sondern überhaupt mit unserer ganzen Syntax, wie wir sprechen. Also, wer ist Subjekt in einem Satz, wenn wir etwas schreiben? Also nicht nur in... Äh, so. Und wir haben gemerkt in unserer Arbeit, dass zum Beispiel der, unsere Kollegen aus Kamerun, die alle Germanisten sind, irgendwann nicht mehr über Objektgeber sprechen wollten. Also wer hat das dem Objekt dem Museum gegeben, sondern nur noch von Objektraffern gesprochen haben. Und das heißt, die, also die Terminologie, aber auch die Syntax hat sich stark verändert. Und, und damit hängt, hängt die Frage, deine Frage vom Anfang, how, also wie wollen, nicht dass, dass man das, sondern wie man das macht. Und die Frage der Standards ist natürlich eng verbunden mit dem Blickpunkt, wie man drauf. Zum Beispiel, ganz einfaches, banales Beispiel im Rahmen unseres großen Projektes Atlas der Abwesenheit, haben wir ein Buch gemacht, ne? mit allen Daten, Forschungsdaten auf einem Repositorium für alle Zeiten, der TU etc. So, und dann kommt es zu, dem, zu der Frage, wir machen ein Register mit Namen und Vornamen und stellen fest, dass für unsere Kollegen in Kamerun die Reihenfolge Namen und Vornamen einfach fluide ist, sehr fluide auch in ihrer eigenen Nennung, also ich bin, ich bin Savoy im, im Umgang so und so weiter. Das bedeutet, wenn man anfängt, eine Datenbank füllen zu wollen und nicht so klar und auch nicht so wichtig ist, was Vorname und was Name ist, dann sind, ist die Frage der Standards eine sehr schwierige. Und natürlich kann man das machen, mit den Standards anfäng, anfangen, aber ich, ich glaube sehr, dass dass man nicht damit anfangen sollte mhm. und dass die Museen das auf gar keinen Fall alleine machen sollen beziehungsweise gar nicht machen sollen. Weil das einfach so viel Zeit kostet, diese Arbeit, diese Hände im Motor, so viele Arbeit, so viel politisches Wollen, dass zum Beispiel die Kollegen eine gewisse Mobilität haben, das Wiesen. All diese Sachen, die, die, die damit zusammenhängen, das hängt damit zusammen. Also es gibt nicht nur Datas und, und die richtige Kategorie. Es gibt, wie komme ich überhaupt zu einer Kategorie, die die anderen interessiert. Ich nenne ein letztes Beispiel. Wir hatten eine wunderbare Tagung. Hier eine Kollegin aus Princeton sagte, wenn in den Datenbanken steht, das Objekt ist aus Holz. Es ist wurscht, <lacht> weil es kommt darauf an, welches Holz das ist. Aus einem bestimmten Holz kann es eine Müslischale sein mit der ich meine, oder was esse, also ein Wegwerfobjekt. Wenn es ein anderes Holz ist, äh, ist das ein sakrales Objekt. Das heißt, einfach nur Holz bringt nichts. Missnaming, das falsche Nennen von Sachen, also zu sagen Schale, während es was anderes ist oder einen eigenen Namen hat, das ist auch, das macht das Ding unbrauchbar in der Datenbank, wenn man es nicht findet, weil kein Mensch und so weiter und so fort. Und ähm, deshalb glaube ich, dass Standards wichtig sind oder hätten sein sollen, in dem Augenblick, wo die Museen das verpasst haben, wie Bibliotheken sich auszustatten. Aber jetzt frage ich mich wirklich manchmal, okay, es ist alles verpasst worden, es gibt eben keine Bibliothekskataloge für Museen. Was macht man trotzdem jetzt? Und deshalb ähm, ähm, glaube ich, ja, dass vielleicht tatsächlich die Museen einfach das machen sollen, was sie können mit ihren zehn Personen für so großen Sammlungen und dass der Rest der Welt außerhalb der Museen den Rest macht. Und das sind wir, jeder Einzelne mit seiner eigenen Verantwortung. So. Michael, would you oh. mind to summarize a little bit? Um, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Michael. <laughs> No, that's not easy to summarize, but um, yeah, uh, I, I start with, with what you said at, at the end of, of um, your comment um, that, um, yeah, w w again referring the, the example of a library catalog that um, how, how do we deal um, if we cannot have a, something similar to a library catalog for, for the museum objects and 
would it make sense to really wait for standards when, and that's when Benedict referred to um, some of her projects, her recent projects um, dealing with, with African colonial her heritage, um, so um, that um, she, she made, or her project team made the experience that um, uh, in this context, what is the pre-name and the sure name often was mixed up or didn't really um, matter at all. So um, how d could you fill in um, uh, this data in a standardized form when um, you cannot differentiate between pre-name and sure name? This would bring you to, um, um, to boundaries within our, or our thinking of standardized concepts as well as um, if something is from wood, maybe a bowl of wood, um, but wood can be something sanctuary in this context, but it can also be just a profane material. Um, so, um, yeah, um, but you would enter wood in, into a database, but um, without um, really knowing what the actu actual meaning is, and is it really a bowl or is it something else? So what we see and what we think might be um, standardized um, entry for a database must not be what this object, cultural object, was actually meant for, so you wouldn't find it. And is this thinking and standards really helpful for us? And this would also lead me to what I wanted to say, because I wanted to differentiate um, um, what um, I think what you understood, um, Larissa, when I made my, my comment earlier. Um, I didn't want to really um, um, uh, have, have these projects with communities. But I think um, when we do not think so much about data and just give it to the communities, they might interfere from their own. So mm. um, uh, for, for my example, with, in the Nazi Adelwood, um, we uh, work a lot with um, auction catalogues and we often have the names of the consigners and buyers in these auction catalogues. Um, and um, mostly it's only the sure names. So these are thousands of sure names of, of people who consigned something to an auction or bought something at an auction that we would have to identify, which is kind of silly because we often do not know where these people came from. Do they really... It is an auction in Munich, but was the consigner really from Munich or was it was he, he from Hamburg or Berlin? I don't know. But maybe someone could identify this name and say, well, this is the birth name of my grandmother, something that would take us years to find out. But maybe there's someone who knows this name and could help. But this would, um, yeah, um, uh, voraussetzen. <laughs> Uh, this would precondition that, that um, the people know that these information are there and that they are available and that they have access to it and that they can find this information. So this is what I meant when I talked about yeah. working with communities and giving them the access My comment to wasn't directed yeah. at your <laughs> yes. example. <laughs> Yeah. My, my mm. tough role here to uh, yeah. cut off a little bit the discussion, <laughs> there is so much in it uh, mm. and uh, I, I hope uh, to see uh, many of you um, tomorrow and, and on Sunday and to continue the discussion. But I would like to give the uh, audience also the opportunity to ask questions. And maybe let's start with a question from the local audience here. So we have a microphone. Um, do you want to... Uh, ah, yeah, there's a microphone over there. So, and we already we have, have a first question, right, over mm. here. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all. That was very rich and uh, uh, very, very informative and thought-provoking. Uh, I wanted to follow up on this question of what information should be mandatory, uh, which also intersects with the mm. question of how detailed does it have to be, this problem of standards. Um, for years, I've been collecting provenance information from various museums around the world, and I have been, um, uh, I noticed how different it is from museum to museum, some of which provide no information at all, and some of which provide much more information. And I was wondering, why can't we simply um, uh, establish as a very basic, low, easy, 
the common denominator, make the CSV files available with simply the text in them. Other people can do linked data if they want. There's all kinds of other things you can build on it. And um, what Larissa said about we need to go to the manufacturers, the suppliers of the museum collection systems and impose certain standards on them, um, it would seem to me a very basic standard would be you should be able to press a button and generate a CSV file, which includes your basic information, including an information which is simply the provenance text. Mm. With everything, you know, the provenance text and notes, et cetera. And I just wanted to, um, to hear what you thought of that kind of idea. So the question is about uh, raw data like the CSV files and so on, um, and to, uh, yeah, to get as much data out as possible uh, from the collections as directly as possible. Is there any direct response to that here from the panel, maybe? Um, Otherwise, we can have another question or, yeah. I think the the pr problem there is actually that uh, not a lot of museum uh, staff actually know about the um, um, importance of raw data. I think mm -hmm. it's as easy as that. And um, I mean, I took my master's in 2019 um, and part of my, like we never talked about digital collections management um, in the <laughs> practical sense in my uh, during my studies. And I mean, I studied cultural anthropology. There's nothing much you can do with that if you don't work at, an, at a museum or at a university. Um, so um, I think that, for example, museum education and the fields that we study in order to get a career in the museum business is kind of one of the issues there. We are not talking uh, enough about um, yeah, co digital collections management and the importance of raw data. Um, I really hope, for example, that the digital humanities um, faculties will um, change that. We, I see in Sweden a lot of museums getting more and more interested in digital humanities students, um, but um, at the same time I see that museums still are not looking enough for digital skills um, in their um, job um, announcements. Given what, what has been said right now, I think it's actually a good suggestion because translating the last remarks by Benedict also means to understand that making data less raw, that is putting it into a standard, is, and I pick up that for better or worse uh, metaphor of raw and cooked, right, is cooking it. So you bring it into a different context or to be more like, technical, you interpret it, right? And that interpretation already ha can have very, very difficult aspects to it. So in a sense, raw data might even be better for some questions. For others, it probably needs to be processed further. But I think even the assumption that raw data is less informative uh, than standardized data or processed data or formatted data is not necessarily true. Um, there's another question or contribution, and don't mind, you can, you can quickly introduce yourself and uh, the field you are, you're working in. Okay, I'm Liza Weber. Um, I am, I guess, a provenance researcher out on my own in the world, but I was formerly with the provenance lab with Lynn Rotha. And uh, my question kind of follows on from that, but is maybe the other end of the spectrum. And then I'm thinking, coming back to Micah's comment about the fact that we've been neglecting um, communities, speaking to communities. And if we're just to publish raw data, it's provenance data that doesn't really speak <laughs> to people, to ordinary people. You know, when we put out a provenance statement, we're looking at like a syntactic, semantic mess and how do we make sense of it? And I feel maybe on the opposite end of the spectrum, we need to give more narrative. We need to be more generous <laughs> with stories because that's when the public can really come forth and be part of that conversation. Otherwise, we're continuing to alienate them. And I don't think we're really building then a global cultural commons. So yeah. the idea, as far as I get it, is... Uh, uh, in order to uh, get to closer to a, a shared heritage, a cultural commons, um, 
you need to to be more generous with uh, the kind of stories that uh, yeah. So not one, just one contribute stop, to. It's like actually mm -hmm. saying there's a gap here and it's yeah. a problematic Thanks. gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you help us fill it? Mm -hmm. Because I don't people yeah. people don't know. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's what I also meant in the beginning when I said it's all, <coughs> mostly it's um, in Germany, it's on German platforms that have kind of an introductory text or something like that, which is in German. So <laughs> who, nobody really understands w what is this kind of a database and, and what can I search here and what is the information I get here. So even there's a, a huge gap still. So I think there's another perspective on this. Uh, digital humanities has been mentioned and that museums maybe should take care uh, more of um, involving uh, people who do research in this field. And uh, I think it's also about uh, good data practices in research. So, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. we are involved with uh, NFDI for Culture, which is like a consortium that uh, tries to promote uh, good um, you know, practices in terms of research data. So we often have this term of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? Fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that it's not the opposite of uh, delivering raw data, but instead of taking care of workflows where you get things right from the beginning. And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just just one thought before we. So there are several other uh, contributions from the room, but I would also like to pick at least one question, if you don't mind, from the online Slido, because this is the reason why we have the Slido, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really an interesting question. Maybe some of you can contribute here, and this is a question: Can you give a best practice example? Uh, from the most recent times where uh, uh, the, the um, well-prepared information or, or uh, quickly uh, uh, prepared raw data, whatever, helped to uh, solve such a problem or to restitute something. Is there a good problem, uh, a good, <laughs> good, 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 good example where, where, where data or information helped to solve this kind of problem? Maybe the Cameroon example. Ja. Ich arbeite gerne, seitdem es das gibt, mit Benin Digital. Das heißt, das ist eine digitale Datenbank, die erfunden wurde, um diejenigen, die in Nigeria sich auskennen über die Objekte, die so lange Objekte in Anführungszeichen, die Skulpturen, die Reliefs, die geschnitzten Elfen, Elfenbein, also Stoßzähne etc., die sich auskennen, um damit sie diese das Wissen, was in den Museen hier ist, damit Sie das gestalten, so wie Sie das haben wollen, in Form von Videos, von Geschichten, von Narrativen. Also man kann, man sieht die Sachen mit ihren Namen, nigerianischen Namen und, und so weiter. Und die Museumsinformationen von hier sind sehr, sehr weit hinten. Das, was vorne ist, ist äh, äh, eine ganz andre, ein anderer Zugang zum Wissen. Also das, was man, die Epistemologie, die, die Wissensordnung ist eine andere. Die Objekte sind... Objekte anders geordnet, anders genannt. Man kann auf Buttons klicken und hört, wie der Name, hören, wie der Name sich anhört in der äh, Edo-Sprache und so weiter. Und das ist äh, eine Erfindung von Anne Luther und Felicity Bodenstein, die, ähm, die das bis zum Erfolg geführt haben in Kooperation mit äh, verschiedenen Museen in Deutschland, unter anderem in Hamburg, Barbara Plankensteiner. Und für mich ist das ein, ein sehr gutes Beispiel für diese Art von äh, Sammlungen. Ja, so uh, Benedikt referred to Digital Benin. You can look it up at digitalbenin.org, uh, which is a, a project where, where we have this uh, um, idea or this approach that you have um, the rich stories, uh, information from the Nigerian context. So for instance, uh, how uh, are the names of the objects pronounced and so on? in the forefront, so, so this is like, like uh, what, what, what this platform stresses. And then you have some more museum-like kind of information in the background. It's still there, but in, it's in the background. And this is a very recent uh, interesting example, of course. Yeah. So is I there an, another example maybe? Or, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's different kinds of data that we're talking about, but one of my favorite um, um, 
things to work with is actually when people find new stories um, or different stories than the museum does in the data. Um, and that for me work, uh, happens a lot when we work with uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons. Um, because a lot of the things at museums, I mean, roughly four to six percent of uh, museum collection are exhibited at one time, um, point in time. And the museum where I work, Sermons Museum, um, has been rebuilt in 2018 and the magazine, the storages are in the middle of the building and totally in glass. So you can look at into them on all, all sides. And we are kind of trying to do the same thing with the digital collections. Um, and so when we upload things to Wikimedia Commons, we are first making um, um, an inquiry in where is our, our collections, are, actually, are they actually needed? Um, and then we also um, tidy them up in Wikimedia Commons and we see how people have been using them because we are using open licenses all along. And they find different things in our collections that have never been uh, exhibited um, um, as long as we had them in our collections um, uh, and use them in different um, um, contexts. And I think that's um, one of the, the um, most positive things um, working like that. Thing. So also the relationship between what you do in the physical exhibition yeah. space and what you do with the digital communities or online communities. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would like to try at least to allow one last question from the local audience because you are such a fantastic audience. It's, <laughs> it's really so. It's, it's two, but but I I don't know if we have enough time. But who, who was the first or who wants to be the first? I, sorry for that, but yeah. I was first? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sebastian Finsterwalder, I'm a provenance researcher here in, in Berlin in the library and also uh, on the board of the uh, Arbeitskreis Provenienzforschung. Um, regarding the, the question of standardization that, that Larissa Brock raised, um, in my experience, one, one, big, issue, one big issue with um, uh, when you look at the um, at the province research done in, in, in Germany and in German institutions is um, the lack of an, an accessible digital infrastructure um, for for the provenance researchers who, as, as, as Tobias mentioned, um, only work there um, for the most time for a limited period of time and then oftentimes the data, well, not, not, not all the time, but oftentimes goes into a, a folder and never never resurfaces and it is essentially lost. Um, one one main reason why I wanted to attend this, this these these three days was to to um, ask if the 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 Wikiverse is is, is that the thing? Um, <laughs> yes, it's can, a thing. Can, can, it's can, a thing. Can, <laughs> can this maybe provide um, at least at least Part of a solution for for this uh, f uh, f for this or, or or a way towards a solution where where provenance researchers might dump their data to um, <laughs> to have it accessible beyond the the end of their project and also um, on another point is this something that um, that maybe is is, is an approach that, that has to be done with caution because it kind of takes um, institutions like like museums and, and libraries and archives um, out of their um, the verantwortung um, the, the responsibility the, the responsibility <coughs> yeah. takes takes it away from them to to provide such an in infrastructure um, is, is that something that 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 should be considered um, when when we might use Wikidata um, or Wikipedia to, to, to store provenance information if we don't have any other space. So this is so. the question whether Wiki, the Wikiverse can be seen as probably as a part of the uh, digital infrastructure for a shared um, commons of, of provenance data or yeah, uh, is there some statement or some thought about this? Very interesting question, I think. Yes and no. <laughs> I think every Wikipedian, Wikidatan or Wikimedia Commons user would be really nervous if I would say, yes, dump your data there. 
Um, that's not the right, the right place for raw um, research data, for, the, for example. I mean, both Wikipedia and Wikidata are not working with original uh, re research data. Um, you always have to have a, um, a source, for example, for a published source for your findings. Um, but there are definitely uh, um, uh, other ways to store your data. I mean, if you look at, for example, Wikipedia, there's the software behind um, Wikipedia, which is also openly licensed, and that's the same. That's the same is true for Wikidata. So I mean, there is Wikidata, Wikibase as a software that you can use, both uh, that you can host yourself or that you can use uh, a cloud-based um, instance. So definitely, there is part of a solution there. But of course, it's the issue is here that we are not talking only about infrastructure, but we're also are talking about people who are taking care of data, and I don't think that it's. It's totally fine to use the infrastructure, but I don't think that you can always... Um, and that we're talking about outsourcing again. You can't um, expect the community to do all the management that institutions don't have the resources to do. I think there has to be a right balance when it comes to responsibility and collaboration, um, from my point of view. Maybe you should add to Wikidata and Wikimedia, Wikidump. You know? <laughs> There's so, some Wikimedia Germany <laughs> people here. I don't think uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. No, but on a, on a more serious note, just quickly, I think your, your concerns are completely well taken, but still, I guess maybe the, the way the Wikiverse works would be a model for how such an infrastructure could work. Mm -hmm. And another way you could look to is the way that academic research right now is being turned over by preprint servers, right? There's, th this is kind of dumps for research that is not well created, not well taken off, uh, but, but still has incredible impact sometimes. And maybe looking at those two models could be inspire, inspire a process where, where this might go. But the issue is that we are trying <laughs> to, we are try, trying to take, um, oh, what it's called, um, it's, it's like you, private, you, you create a problem within an institution and then you expect uh, the society to take mm. care of your problems. And I think you have to go to the problem. We have a, we have a systematic problem in research uh, and in uh, cultural heritage institutions. Um, and we cannot ex uh, expect uh, another sphere mm. of our society to solve those problems. Künstler. Um, Künstler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Then, holen Sie immer Künstler. And I, I don't. I'm. I'm not saying that uh, the that the institutions are doing something wrong, but I think we have to address the systematic underlying issue mm. as well. And we cannot only try to um, uh, solve those with the help of a community. So one footnote also for you, for the online audience, who uh, maybe somebody maybe. Uh, uh, you don't know it yet. So Wikibase is uh, the software that is underlying Wikidata. And for instance, Lynn is doing things with artistry and Wikibase. And you know, in fact, we do also cultural heritage things with Wikibase in Hannover. Have a look at it. And uh, I think it's a, an interesting middle ground because it shares some, some of the nice things we like about Wikidata. But then at the same time, you can deploy it at your place and take care yeah. of it. And have a well curated a community and it doesn't need to be public. That's it also a different. It doesn't need to be public. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. also yeah. big. To use it with students, for example, yeah. for people and provenance, and then yeah, you can do it in a closed wiki base. But then you can always decide to actually publish yeah. it in Wikidata, which is also the the goal. And I think. This yeah. yeah. So I think we are. Uh, Julius. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I, I have to have a look at the regie, and yeah. because I'm not quite sure if we have a few minutes left. Yes, we have. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So another question. Um, yeah, I try to be sh short and maybe also not a question. I'm Jus Ratzinski, art historian, but here I speak as a long-term Wikipedian. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that came up in the question earlier: um, what is not, it's not just about data and stuff, but also about the science communication of provenance research. And I think provenance mm. research is particularly bad at it. And that's why <laughs> there also are the money issues, because it's hard to communicate why it's important, why we need it and stuff. And um, I think to the da data published and stuff must also be framed by explaining what is provenance research in the first place and explaining it well and for different audiences with different levels of understanding. And we can't just rely on media 
that comes in with the Gullet case and then it's a billion dollar case, but it isn't. And why isn't it? And the audience doesn't really get it. And all that stuff. And I think we need to find better ways how to tell those stories, how to, how to explain what we actually do. And a reader by Zuschlag doesn't solve this. That is, again, for a very narrow audience and doesn't reach it. And so the Wikipedia article on Provence Research, I haven't looked at it recently, but I think it's shit. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it's one of the first uh, um, hits in the Google search and stuff like that. And also, I think... Um, uh, blogs and stuff like that could also find ways um, of telling those stories in an accessible way. Provenance exhibitions got better in the last years doing that. My mom is a proof for that. So um, I, I think that is something that not, needs to go hand in hand with providing the data, with doing the research. And um, it's basically also advertisement of the research and the data production that we do. And uh, we especially in the German context, European context, we don't think enough about it. Americans are better at it, but maybe we can learn something. Thanks so much, Julius. I think this is a very good hint that we do not need only to take care about structured data, but it's also about stories, and also stories about your work, what you do, right? And we have this interesting ecosystem of, of uh, web um, uh, original uh, media-like blogs and so on. And uh, in addition to what we do on, on Wikidata, Wikimedia Commons and so on. So, um, okay, I allow one last very <laughs> quick question from the audience here, I can, um, yeah, very arbitrary. Is there any, uh, or, or I can pick one from Slido? I pick one from Slido. No, 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 so, no. 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 Uh, Lucas, there's one? Okay. Lucas Fuchsgruber. Wonderful. But now yeah. we always put the physical before the digital. I don't know if that's <laughs> okay. But we did one of the digital, please. The yeah. local first, yes. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure how to ask the question, but now as it's the last chance to ask a question, I will ask it. Um, I think a lot of the statements that were made towards museums, not using standards, not having catalogs, and not publishing their data, I think are more true for provenance researchers. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, <laughs> and that would be you. And so I'm just wondering, uh, are we having like a stray man debate, like blaming the others? <laughs> because Digital Benin have a wonderful website, but they don't publish their research data and and also a lot of the projects that were mentioned on stage also didn't publish research data and even the um, Deutsche Zentrum für Kulturgutverluste, I mean all the reports now they are online as PDFs I think but this is also not research data so and museums in fact they do have catalogs and they follow their museum standards that have been established like 60 years ago already and so they are doing it and you are not doing it and it's not a nice question <laughs> I know and I don't want to ruin the evening now it's <laughs> just really so what are you willing to do to have the problem of open data and the digital co digital commons yeah sorry uh, it's not a nice question and uh, we can also leave it like this here yeah, sorry <laughs> Ich würde gerne sagen, dass wir jedenfalls, wenn ein Projekt, ein, ein Forschungsprojekt zum Thema Provenienz zum Beispiel von der Deutschen Forschungsgemeinschaft gefördert wird, dass die Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft seit einigen Jahren äh, es obligatorisch macht, dass die Forschungsdaten veröffentlicht werden. In unserem Fall, das hier, lieber Lukas, bekannte Kamerun-Projekt, sind alle die Forschungsdaten, also die Forschungsergebnisse, die Stories, die Erzählungen, die Umkehrung der Perspektive etc. ist geschrieben in Texten zwischen zwei Buchdeckeln und das Buch ist in Open Access und äh, als, als Objekt. Da aber die Datas, die Forschungsdatas, mit denen wir die Karten gezeichnet haben, etc. Zum Beispiel 4000 Seiten Inventaren für 40.000 Objekte aus Kamerun. All das ist oft, müssen wir, will die DFG, dass es abgelegt wird. Und in dem Fall ist es auf dem Repositorium der TU Berlin. Ein bisschen schwer zu navigieren, aber es geht. Und wir haben gerade in diesem Projekt, wo die Vielsprachigkeit wichtig ist und die Zugänglichkeit aus Kamerun etwa oder aus Frankreich etc., da haben wir über dem Repositorium der TU Berlin, weil es so ein bisschen äh, auf Deutsch ist und kompliziert, oder kompliziert, ähm, haben wir das jetzt gedoppelt durch eine andere Seite, die uns hilft, da reinzugehen. Äh, und in diesem Fall 
würde ich sagen, selbst wenn wir das nicht selber gewollt hätten, das offen zu machen und wir wollten es von vornherein, zwingt die DFG, er zwingt das die DFG äh, und das ist gut so. Und deswegen denke ich, dass diese, also diese letzte Meldung vielleicht vor drei Jahren richtig gut gewesen wäre oder nicht auf DFG geförderte Projekte zutrifft. Darf ich doch? Same for Volkswagen Foundation. I mean, it's like that everything we do will be published uh, as part of the project and then to the end of the project. I think there was a turning point, especially for research projects in German universities that really have changed it. And I think there's a turning point in museums too. I mean, for the, speaking for the American museums, at the Museum of Modern Art, for example, um, the museum has never uh, created an API as other museums, but it's also not many because it's expensive and cumbersome to maintain them. But then MoMA had regularly a data dump, as so people on GitHub can find MoMA's data, for example, or with provenances, which were very, which were, they had first their own website, then it became, for more transparency, uh, sort of re-included with the entire collection data, but the result was you couldn't actually search for the objects that were or might have been in Europe before 1945 anymore. And then we found a workaround, which unfortunately I have left the museum four or five years ago is still the case, but this workaround is basically a CSV file as an Excel spreadsheet that you download with the entire object relevant, which is an access point. So I think, um, yeah, in universities there's actually an obligation and that is good as it is. So, yeah. we so, so the same, uh, Benedict pointed out that uh, so a major funding body like, like Germany's DFG uh, makes it by now at least a requirement mm -hmm. to make your research, your original research uh, accessible as open, uh, open access publications plus your research data and this is what she did in fact, was the Cameroon research data for instance. Not me, but also Professor yeah, yeah. Guafo from yeah. the Uni Chang. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, and uh, I'm sorry, I think if it feels like we could go on forever, <laughs> and we will do, but tomorrow, <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> Thanks again uh, for your attendance, for your great questions, for this great panel. I'm really happy to have mm. you here and uh, have a good night and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.